Church, if you just keep your Bibles open there to John chapter 13, I want to kind of review just a little bit the context that's taking place in John chapter 13. When you look in 13, 1, verse 1, what you see there is that Jesus is saying, the time has come. He knew that the time had come, that he had fulfilled God's will on this earth. He was headed to the cross. He would die on the cross. His blood would be given for the sins of man. He would be taken down, buried. He would raise again. God would raise him up three days later. And the resurrection would take place. He would spend 40 days on this earth, and then the ascension took place, and he went to heaven where he is today. But that is the redemption story. That is the redemptive work that was taking place that God had determined would take place and uh, pay for the sins of mankind. And Jesus said, I knew, I knew. He said, I know this time has come. And so he's preparing the disciples for his departure. And he's going to do something that is amazing in that chapter where he washes their feet. We'll talk about that uh, during our time in the Word today. Then he goes on to then uh, address the one who is the deceiver, the one who would sell him out for 30 pieces of silver, Judas. And he goes out and he begins to do his bidding uh, to sell Jesus out. And then he turns to the disciples and he begins to continue to prepare them for what is to come. And that's where we pick up the text today in our series, Peter, Reckless, Wrecked, and Radical. And we are still in the section of Peter's life that we are defining as reckless. And what Peter's going to do in the text uh, that Tom read for us a moment ago, 31 through 38, you will see that um, Peter makes this statement that he would give his life. He said, I will lay down my life for you in verse 37. That is the title of the message today, Peter's Declaration. He makes this incredible declaration of giving his life for Jesus. No matter what. No matter what, he's going to give his life. You say, well, how is that reckless? Well, that's what we're going to see today. Did you know one of the most um, tuned-in topics you can preach on is knowing the will of God? This particular text deals with the knowing and accepting of the will of God. Of God. And Peter's going to teach us so much about that in the text today. You know, Peter makes this declaration, and it is tied to Peter's determination. If there was ever a determined person, it was Peter. I mean, he had this, this unbelievable determination. And, and that determination, though, is tied to Peter's disobedience. There is a direct act of disobedience that we're going to see in the text today, and that disobedience is tied to Peter's self-deception. And his self-deception was simply this. He thought he knew better than Jesus and God when it came to the fulfillment of God's will. I mean, that's it. He was self-deceived, and he had this attitude of disobedience. You have to really look here to see it, but it's here. And it came out of this determination which he made through this declaration that he was willing to lay down his life. And so in this declaration, Peter's going to teach us three ways that we miss the will of God. Are you in the will of God? Can you say with confidence, I know I'm living my life and I am in the will of God. And I, and I just feel strong about that. I feel good about that. Or, or, or is there a question? You're not sure. I want to say to you, listen, we're going to learn these three things from Peter, and it's kind of like reverse. You know, typically you hear the sermon that says, here's what you do to know the will of God. Well, what I want to say to you today is, here's the three things you don't do so you don't miss the will of God. And Peter's going to teach us those three things. And so I want us to break this down and take a look at it, and I know it's going to be helpful to you as it's been helpful to me as I've studied it this week. So let's take a look at these three parts to missing the will of God. The first comes out of verses 31 through 35, which will kind of break that down into four parts so we can really understand what's taking place. But the, the point is simply this. We fail to listen. When we fail to listen, we will miss the will of God. 
You have a responsibility and I have a responsibility to hear God speak. You say, does he speak audibly? I've never heard God speak to me audibly, but he speaks through his word. The Holy Spirit that lives within me impresses God's truth upon my heart. He may work through people and circumstances, but ultimately it's all tied back to the Word of God. And that's how He speaks in this day and time. He speaks through the Word of God. And I have a responsibility to listen. But let me break this down into four parts so we can see what is taking place. So we will begin with simply this, the glorification that Jesus is explaining in verse 31 and 32. So this is important to understand. And He says here, When he was gone, Jesus said, Now is the Son of Man glorified. And God is glorified in him. If God is glorified in him, God will glorify the Son in himself and will glorify him at once. The little word now that begins this explanation of glorification tells us something about God's timing in the universe. God's timing for redemption. This is what is known as the fulfillment of time. As we looked in John 13, 1, we said that Jesus knew this time had come. You can go over to Galatians 4, 3 and 5, and Genesis 21, 2, John 2, 4, John 7, 6, Mark 1, 15. And all of these verses tie this together, this understanding, this theological understanding of the fulfillment of time. God set this in place way back when, and now, now this is going to be fulfilled. Now is the Son of Man glorified. And so this is God's timing. It is a divinely appointed hour. And when you talk about what's to come in this hour, from a human perspective, we'd say, you know, that's not something that's very pleasant. That deals with human suffering. And yes, there is suffering that takes place. But when you look at it from a divine point of view, what you see is glory, glorification. Um, He says the Father's going to be glorified, and the Father's glorified, the Son's going to be glorified. And what the Spirit of God is all about is when Jesus is glorified, and the Father is glorified, that's what the Spirit is all about. And it is the glorification of God. And so you've got this back and forth in the Scripture here that talks about glorification of God and Jesus. And if you and I should have a goal in life, it should be to bring glory to God. We should bring glory to Jesus. And if we're interested in those things, and are living our life in such a way, then the Holy Spirit's going to lead and guide us in the will of God. Now, all this glorification that we're talking about here is tied to, don't miss this, obedience. It is tied to obedience. Some people never live their life for the glory of God because they're never obedient to the Word of God. They live for themselves. But we can't live for ourselves if we're going to bring glory to God. And this is the spiritual principle that Peter would need to learn. Now, if this is what he needed to learn, it's what you and I need to learn. Because there's a lot of Peter in us. There's a lot of Peter in me. There's a lot of Peter in you, more more than you realize. And if you don't understand that obedience is tied to glorification, you're going to miss the whole point of the entire text. Because God is saying something to each and every person that's in this room, and it's simply this. There are things that He wants you to obey. There are truths that He wants you to obey. There are things that He wants you to accomplish. He's gifted you. He's called you. He's placed you here to be His ambassador, to serve Him. I mean, we could go on and on, but the long and the short of it is you're not here just to take up space, just to mark off time with your life. God longs to use you. And if He's going to work through you for His glory, He's going to call you to be obedient to His Word. And being obedient to His Word is what will then fulfill His will, which will bring glory to His name. And all of this is tied together. Now, Jesus wasn't acting as Peter was. He wasn't assuming that God's way was not the best way. See, Peter thought that he had a better way than Jesus and God. But Jesus wasn't doing that. Jesus modeled a life of surrender. Jesus modeled a life of servanthood that we'll see. When he was in the Garden of Gethsemane, what did he do? He prayed, right? And as he prayed, um, he was real about it. And he's like, if there's another way, let's do another way. But if it's not, I want your will, not mine. 
And he went through this agony of surrender in, in this garden of Gethsemane, right? You know the story. But out of that, in that surrender, he was empowered to rise up and fulfill the will of God, even though it was going to be hard. And until we understand that, and we're going to live like Jesus lived, and we're not going to understand what it means to be obedient, even in the tough things he asks us to do, that he will empower us to do, that will bring glory to his name. Now, Jesus here, this is on the front side of that Garden of Gethsemane experience. But he is giving verbal testimony to the obedience that is to come that will bring glory to the Father. He's saying, listen, this is about to happen, and when this happens, it's going to bring glory to the Father. You know what the disciples should have said? They should have said, praise God. Man, we can get behind that if that's going to bring glory to the Father. But they're not getting this. They're not understanding this. Because in verse 33, they missed the whole glorification part because he begins to speak about his transition in verse 33. The transition is communicated. Listen to what he says. He says, my children, I will be with you only a little longer. You will look for me. And just as I have told the Jews, so I tell you now, where I am going, you cannot come. Do you think that's clear? I mean, Jesus is being pretty clear here, is he not? He said, where I'm going, you cannot come. Read the story about a five-year-old boy who went and visited uh, a friend. And he went to, over to his house, and uh, the family that he was visiting, they were big hunters. They liked to get out and hunt. And there he saw antlers, and he saw mounted deer heads, and shotguns, and the whole thing. And he got so excited about hunting, and he came, went home, and this is a true story. And he told his mom, he said, Mom, for Christmas I want a bow, an arrow, and a gun. And she looked at her little boy who was five years old. She said, I'm sorry, buddy, uh, but we're just not hunting people. He goes, oh, don't, don't worry about that, Mom. I don't want to hunt people. I want to hunt animals. <laughs> now, that's some miscommunication, right? They, they were having a hard time communicating. What Jesus communicated right here in verse 33, what I want to say to you, this is clear. I, I mean, there's no question here. He said, where I am going, you cannot come. Now, he didn't say it like that, I don't think. I think he just said it. I think he just said, where I'm going, you cannot come. But Peter would not receive that clear communication. And if you can't receive the clear communication that is tied to the will of God, you'll never be obedient or bring glorification to the Father. See, this is the rub. Here's the rub. This understanding of God's will was not matching what the disciples wanted to happen. They wanted something different. They were grappling with what they believed to be the will of God or what they wanted the will of God to be. Now catch this because this is where you and I struggle. We get an idea in our minds. We think, well, if I go do this, that'll bring glory to God. Or if God blesses me in this way, then I can bring glory to God. We get ideas in our mind. And then we try to take the idea and convince God that's his will. And this is what Peter's struggling with. And so when he says that they're going to leave, he can't receive that because that's not what he has in his mind. What they had in their mind is that he was going to establish a kingdom here on earth. They were going to rule with him. They were going to become powerful. And great things were going to happen here on this earth. They could not receive the fact that Jesus was about to leave. They could not receive the fact that he had been telling them that he was going to go to the cross and he would go through crucifixion and he would suffer and he would die. They didn't want to hear that. And that's the way you and I are many times. We have this tendency. Let me just tell you, and I know because I, I, I struggle with this. I'm sure you probably do as well. We have this tendency to try to talk God into what we think is best from our perspective. Here's my word of counsel to you. Don't do it. Don't do it. It is so dangerous to do that. Don't go there. You'll be disappointed absolutely every time. This is kind of how it goes so often as we pray. We say, God, God, reveal your will. I want to know your will. God says, okay. And he reveals his will to us right from the scripture. Something true, something we've been praying about. And he reveals his will. And, and, and we hear it and we think, well... Hmm, I don't know. 
I don't know that I understand that fully. So we go back to God and we plead with him, say, God, please reveal your will. Because obviously I don't think that's it. And so God says, okay. Then a second time, once again, he reveals his will. And we just can't believe it. And we can't accept it. So then we try to then, after two tries of God revealing his will, then we go on the offensive and we try to convince God that this is not his will. There's got to be a better way. Have you ever done that? I have. I've fallen into that trap. And so what happens in that, though, is now you're in a battle with the will of God. Now, I'm not suggesting in prayer that we don't get with God and we don't share our hearts. I'm not saying we don't get with God and say, God, I would like this. And have you thought about this? And what about this? You know, go, go to God. He, the Bible says he already knows your needs. Go to the secret place, it says in Matthew chapter 6. Get alone with God. Share your heart with him. But you've got to have a willingness to listen to God. So if God impresses truth on your heart because you're off base, you've got to be willing to accept that, right? Um, I cannot change. There are some things that I cannot change about God's will. And there's some things that God brings into my life unexpectedly at a time when I don't, I'm not sure that's what I want to deal with, you know. And that's really what's going on for the disciples here. This past uh, Friday, um, there's some people who live around me can probably identify with this, but there was a water main a line that broke. Uh, when the heavy rains came, there was a wall that fell into a stream, hit a main line, and broke the water pipe. And so they had to work on that water pipe. And as they were working on that water pipe, they were cutting water on and off throughout several days. Right at the end of the time they were doing that in our neighborhood, they cut the water on. We cut the water on, and it broke. Uh, it burst a pipe. And I heard it in the wall, just, just screaming down in the wall, the water just coming out. And so I ran and grabbed my tool, ran out to the street, cut the water off, and I thought, oh. And I knew what that meant. It meant my whole weekend I was going to be doing some kind of plumbing, trying to figure out how to fix this, right? And at that moment, I was just like, man, I don't like this. I'm just being real with you. I was like, Lord, I don't like this. I got to do this. I got to do this. I got to do this. And I got to do this. And the Lord's like, no, you're going to do this because you don't have any water. You're going to do some plumbing. And so I had to do some research. I had to tear the, tear the wall out, get to the place where it broke, and, and spend my time trying to fix that fix that problem, right? But I tell you that story simply because of this. It illustrates the fact that in our human nature, when our schedule is interrupted, we don't like it. And see, when Peter and the disciples got the word from who? Jesus, their Savior, that the time had come, they did not like it. Now, I'm going to ask you a question. Is there something God has brought into your life that you just don't like? And you're just not ready to accept it, right? I mean, I mean I, I've been there. And I've not, just that little silly illustration I gave you about something very practical, but very spiritually speaking, God can bring anything he wants into my life today and say, Mark, this is what I need you to do. I may agree with it or not agree with it. I may understand it or not understand it. But God brings it. That's what I want you to understand. And when sovereign God says this is what must happen, and you got to think about, think about what Peter's fighting against here. He is fighting against what? He is fighting against, listen, the fulfillment of time when the Savior of the world is going to die for the sins of man. And Peter thinks he knows a better way. Can you imagine that? Can, can, you, can you get your mind around that? From the beginning of time, Jesus would come, be the Savior of the world, and Peter's saying, I know a better way, and I don't like what you're saying. Do you think if he spent an hour, he could change it in prayer? How about if he spends two hours? What if he fasts and pray? What if he spends a week in prayer? How about 40 days in prayer? I don't care if he spent 100 days in prayer. He's not going to change this. This is something the Father had determined. And it was going to happen, and Jesus was surrendered to it. And here's Peter fighting against it. And I say all that to say this. There are some things that God calls us to that we're not going to change. We do better just to submit to them and surrender. I found that to be true in my own life. But listen, let's just be real. Change is difficult.
difficult for most humans. Would you find that to be true in your own life? I don't know that any of us really like change. It means we've got to change, <laughs> right? You got to do a different schedule. You got to move. You got to sell things, or you've got to engage new people and establish new relationships or do things you've never done before. I mean, but that's how God works. God pushes us out of the nest. God forces us to do things we're not used to doing. But that's how God works. And that's what He's doing here. But this whole talk of transition is stirring up fear in the disciples, and especially Peter, and the way he responds is with all this bravado of what He's going to do. But now I want you to see that not only um, that he bring them along to tell them these things, now he's going to give them a new command. Look at verse 34 and 35. He said, a new command I give you, love one another as I have loved you. So you must love one another. By this all men will know that you are my disciples if you love one another. Probably everybody in this room and those who are watching probably are familiar with this text. But oftentimes, we quote this text, but we don't think about it in the context of which Jesus gave it. We don't think about it in the fact that he was headed to the cross. We don't think about it in the fact that he was preparing the disciples so they could minister in his absence. We don't think about the fact that this was something Peter had to hear, right? But he did. He, Jesus knew he was leaving. He had to give the disciples this command so they would know how to function in his absence, and so he says, love one another. And they're probably thinking, well, how? And he answers that, and he says, just as I, Jesus, loved you. Now, love wasn't a new concept. They had that in the Old Testament. But this concept of loving as Jesus had loved them, the fact that he had washed their feet, the very fact that he was going to go to the cross sacrificially and give his life, um, this sacrificial love, this was new. Sacrificial love commanded toward one another as believers, that was new. And so he goes on to say to them, you must, you must love one another. And when you do, that love you have for one another will equal a witness to all people that I, Jesus, am real. That I, Jesus, am real. Um, did you know your witness and my witness does not work if, and the if falls on us, if we fail to love one another as believers? Some of you here today have the gift of evangelism. God's gifted you, and you can naturally talk to other people, right, about the gospel. And sometimes when we see people exercise that gift, we think, well, that's something they do, not something I do. I want to say to you, every person in here that's been changed, you have a testimony of a changed life. Everybody in here has an opportunity to be a witness. Nobody can take that from you. In fact, listen, the very fact that I am called to love you and you're called to love me, let's just take that as an example. When we do that and we share that love, sacrificial love, um, in, in the spirit of servanthood for I put your needs above mine as the Lord is leading, when that takes place and we're loving one another in that way, guess what? There is a witness that goes out to the world you see, some people have never talked about that witness. But that is a witness. That is one of the first witnesses that goes out. Because how we live should precede what we say. See, Jesus said the things He said because of the way He lived. And if we will live in these truths, then we're going to be more apt to say these truths to someone else. And it begins by our love for one another. I have a neighbor who lives in uh, our, our small neighborhood. And I watch him. And it's just amazing to me. He's a believer in Christ. Goes to a, a sister Baptist church here in town. Very faithful. But he just has a heart of loving other people in our neighborhood, both lost and saved. He has been helping the man that lives beside me. He put some grass in for him the other day. Um, I watch him go from house to house checking on people. And, and as I watch that, listen, I'm watching it. I see what he's doing. I promise you other people are watching that. And as believers take care of believers, guess what happens? It is a testimony to others who are watching. We have other neighbors that we've been witnessing to, and I've been witnessing to them for years to come to know the Lord. 
They come from all different kinds and types of faith. But they're watching that love that we have for one another. And the Scripture says that love that we have for one another is being a witness to everyone who's watching. You have, look, do you understand? Do you understand? You have the power, the ability as you surrender to Christ to let your life radiate to other people that you are saying as you love one another, Jesus has changed my life, and guess what? Jesus is real. See, that was the question. Was he real? Did he really walk on this earth? Did he really die on a cross? Was he really resurrected? And the answer, the best way to answer that to people was yes, and I'll prove it to you by how we are loving one another that he lives within us. And that's powerful. That's why we've got to understand this. See, there was a clear command of what to do, a clear example of how to do it because Jesus had demonstrated it to him. And there was a clear message why we do it, because we're a witness that Jesus is alive. The love we have for one another, it is the validation. It is the serial number. It is the seal of authenticity. It is the certification, the, the notarization that Christians' lives are for real when we love one another. It is not just our Christian steeples, our Christian stickers, our Christian shirts. Those are outward testimonies. But let me tell you something. It's more about the inward faith as we live obedient to the command that Jesus gave us to love one another and the world is watching. That's more important. You say, could they really get this? They had to. If they didn't get it immediately, they'd eventually get it, the Scripture says, because there was an example that they had. Listen, experienced. If you'll come back up out of our text and look at verses 12 through 17 in the chapter. And let me read this to you. When he had finished washing their feet, he put on his clothes and returned to his place. And he asked this question. He said, do you understand what I have done for you? He asked them. You call me teacher and Lord, and rightly so, for that is what I am. Now what uh, now that I, your Lord and teacher, have washed your feet, you also should wash one another's feet, which was a menial task in that day and time. I have set you an example. He set an example. So that you should do, you should do this as I have done for you. I tell you the truth. No servant is greater than his master, nor is a messenger greater than the one who sent him. Now that you know these things, you will be blessed. Anybody here want to be blessed? Anybody in here want to be blessed? Amen. You will be blessed according to the Word of God if you do these things. If you do them, when you take action upon the Word of God, blessing comes. So this is amazing. This is unheard of. Here is Jesus, the author of life, the giver of life. And here he is, girding himself up with a towel, bending down, washing the disciples' feet as an example of what they should do. I'm going to tell you what he did at that very moment. He elevated and he validated the importance of service, humble service, service to others. And he brought it to the highest level possible, as high as I could possibly reach. He, he elevated it. He authenticated it. And there's no question that this is how the believer is to live. Do unto others as you would have them do unto you. Set an example. Live as Jesus did. Do not fall into the fallacy of thinking and acting as though you are greater than Jesus. What? Yeah. He said, you're not above me. I'm your master. I'm your teacher. When you choose not to serve and love one another, you choose not to follow this example, what you're saying is you're greater than me. I've elevated service. I've elevated humble service. And we've got to be careful. You know what he was teaching him? By example, then he taught it verbally, then they would watch it on the cross, is simply this. Obedience brings glorification to the Father. But it comes back on us. If means it's a choice 
you get to make and I get to make every day. It's a choice. Once I understand this, will I live it toward other people? You know, I want to be a witness. I want other people to have what I have. That's Jesus saving me, being my Savior and my Lord. And I say, well, how can I communicate that? Well, it begins by me loving others the way I've been loved. It's by me then, because I'm living that way, speaking when God gives me opportunity to speak because the actions will back up the verbal affirmation of a changed life. And that's what it means to be a witness. Now, that's all in the first point. Can you believe that? Now, we're not going to take that long on the next two. But think about it. That's some good theology right there. Now watch. If all that's true, and it was, and it is, watch the second thing we do. If we fail to listen, this is how we miss the will of God. The second thing is we refuse to accept. <laughs> Look, watch this in 36 and 37. Simon Peter asked him, Lord, where are you going? Jesus replied, where I'm going, you cannot follow now, but you will follow later. Peter asked, Lord, why can't I follow you now? See, Jesus knew the intent of Peter's question. He wasn't asking this so he could send him a postcard when he found out where he was going. No, it was because Peter was planning to follow Jesus, even though Jesus, listen, clearly communicated, Peter, you cannot follow me. He didn't say Peter, he was talking to all of them, but it was to him. But Peter wouldn't accept it. And then he pushes back with a second time coming. And we see it in verse 37. He says, Lord, why can't I follow you now? Any parent that has a very determined child knows how this works. No, you can't do that. Why can't I do that? You just can't do that. Can I do it now? Can I do it in 10 minutes? Can I do it in 30 minutes? Why can't I do it? Why can't you? No, you can't do it, right? Any parent that has a determined child understands that. Well, what Jesus is dealing here is with a determined Peter who will not accept the clear communication that he cannot follow. Now, hang on. Let's not be too hard on Peter. How many times have we done that? God says, this is what I want you to do. Or, or you, I don't want you, you know, doing this and we just appeal. No, I want to do that. And Why can't I do that? And, and surely this is right. And then we go searching for scriptures to back up so we can argue with God, right? So we can have our way instead of God's will. See, that's the problem. We want our way, not God's will, really. Oh, Peter. Peter, Peter, Peter. He's doing this publicly among the other disciples, but we tend to do this silently with God in our hearts. That's what happens. I can't tell you, I was thinking about this point. I can't tell you how many people I've come across throughout the years where God would call them, and I'm going to talk specifically to ministry because people have talked to me about that as a minister of the gospel and having gone through the call and surrendered to that and living in that reality, that there was a time in their life God called them to ministry, but they refused to accept it. And later in life, there's so much regret but they'll come and say, how did you surrender? And Man, I should have surrendered. And back when God was working in my life, I should have done that. And there's so much regret. And I can't even begin to tell you people that have lived in that. And so what I want to say to you in that is simply this. When God calls you to something, don't argue with Him. Surrender to Him. Do it now. See, Peter said, said Lord, why can't I follow you now? That was the issue for Peter. He wanted to do everything now. It was all about Peter wanting the timing to be what Peter wanted it to be. And I, and I kind of get this because I struggle with God's timing. I struggle with the way he does things sometimes and the timing of the things. And I'm so limited in my perspective. He's got this holistic view of the world. And, and so finally, I always come back and I surrender and say, God, you see the big picture. I'm only seeing a dot. But I want it now. Why can't we do this now? See, do you struggle with that like I do at times? That you want it now? That's what Peter's struggling with. But the reason he couldn't was he would have interfered with that which was going to come through all the way through because it was God's sovereign will that Jesus be the Savior of the world. But it didn't matter to Peter. Look at the third thing we do when we miss the will of God, we refuse, the second was to refuse to accept. 
But then the third, we declare our action. Look at 37b and 38. Here's what he says. I will lay down my life for you. There's his declaration. That's what we're talking about, this whole deal. This is how we got there. Then Jesus answered, will you really lay down your life for me? I tell you the truth. Before the rooster crows, you will disown me three times. That had to be spooky for him. What was he talking about? Roosters crowing? Me denying? No way, Lord. I just told you I'm going to lay down my life. And so what you have here is an understanding that, listen, Peter, he doesn't know his heart as well as Jesus knows his heart. He's going to back up this reasoning with this human effort, this declaration that he's going to lay down his life. And I promise you the other disciples are going, man, he's a brave one. Man, look at him. Man, Peter's our leader. He's the guy. Look at him. He's going to lay down his life. I'm not sure I would, but Peter's going to. Man, may I say to you, in that declaration, he was living recklessly because he was pushing back against the very will of God that he had been clearly spoken to about. And this is why he's being so reckless. This is a declaration of recklessness and disobedience on his part. And I get it. I've done it. How about you? And so he comes back with this statement. Will you really lay down your life for me? What a question. Will you really? Let me tell you the truth, Peter. Let me tell you what's really going to happen here. For the rooster crows, you will disown me three times. I don't want to be like Peter. I don't want to determine to move ahead no matter what Jesus says. But you know what? We can all get caught in that, can't we? I don't want to. Luis Palau said these words. He said, until we remove the obstacles that prevent us from realizing full obedience to Christ, we will be unfulfilled, restless, and discontent Christians. He went on to say about Peter, he said, Peter refused to understand that he couldn't have his own way and God's will at the same time. Isn't that really the issue? We want our way and God's will at the same time. It just doesn't work like that. It doesn't work like that. Walter Knight told a story, this is a very old story, um, about a Scottish woman And back in that day, she would go from home to home as she traveled from town to town through the countryside selling her products. But she was known for the fact that when she came to an unmarked crossroads that she would toss a stick in the air and go in the direction the stick pointed when it landed. Now that's some kind of GPS, isn't it? Anybody ever tried one like that? But one day, however, she was seen tossing the stick up several times in the air. And someone asked her, said, why do you toss the stick more than once? Oh, because, the woman replied, it keeps pointing to the left and I want to go to the right. She then dutifully kept throwing the stick up in the air until it pointed the way she wanted to go. You know what our problem is sometimes? God's telling us where to go and we're throwing the stick in the air until it goes the way we want to go. We just keep throwing it up there. You know, that's what Peter was doing. But he was doing it forcefully in the presence of Jesus, demanding really what he wanted. But I want to say to you, when God bolts the door, don't try to get through the window. It's reckless. It's reckless. It's best to rest in the commands of God. Accept where you are. Take his commands Live them and let him lead you wherever you need to go. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Father, so much talk about wanting to know your will and fulfill your will. Would you help us with an honest heart really come to a place of surrender today? That if you reveal your will, whether it's what we want or what we like, whether it's hard, whether it's easy, whatever it may be, that we would just surrender and know the strength that only you can give us to fulfill that. God, I don't want to fight against you. I don't want to appear to be bold and brazen and brave. 
when in reality I'm being rebellious. I don't want to do that, Lord. I want to know your will and surrender to it. Even if it's not what I want or can understand. I pray that would be the heart of every person in this room, God. Forgive us, God, for wanting our way and your will at the same time. Forgive us. Church, I'm asking you this morning, what is it that God's calling you to obey? It's probably, it's going to be different probably for every person. Now we can say generally we're called to love one another, yes. But in the specifics of that, it's going to look different in every person's life. What is God calling you to obey? And there's a whole series of questions and things that we could talk about to determine that. But I, I, I want to trust the Holy Spirit can reveal that to you today. And I simply want to ask, are you willing to surrender to what God reveals to you? Father, thank you for your patience with us. Thank you for continuing to love us and show us mercy. Thank you that you don't give up on us. Thank you. I love that about this text and about this whole thing that we're studying with Peter is you knew what was in his heart and you kept developing him. You kept loving him and bringing him along. And I pray that you would do that in our lives today. But may we not fight you, but may we live by faith. We love you in the name of Jesus. Amen.